Dust in a Legion Tale is an action RPG beat em up anthropomorphic animal hand drawn platformer Metroidvania slice video game, developed almost entirely by Dean Dodrill, with Hyperduck Studio doing the soundtrack. The last time I played this game was about four years ago, which is about as long as it took for Dean to make this game. Now that I think about it, I've never even beaten this game. Not because it was too hard or anything, just. I guess I just lost interest. But dang, I should have definitely kept playing because Dust is fun. In Dust, you play as Dust. You slash the ever-loving hell out of whatever stands in your way. After doing that for long enough, you'll level up, in a pretty extravagant manner, might I add, and become stronger. The various items you find in your journey will also help with that, but I'm getting ahead of myself. Let's start at the beginning. The game starts with a flashback to a lone soldier fighting hordes of... farmers? Well, whatever they are, they stand absolutely no chance. Press J to wage war, now that is a good button prompt. Probably up there with press F to pay respect and push start to rich. And press X to- Jason! Dust wakes up in a forest that meets the blade of Ara and Fidget, this orange flying thing. These two will be your companions for the rest of the game, also providing most of the dialogue. Apparently, Dust has no idea who he is, but Ara suggests him to head to the village in the east. Usually I would discuss the story of the game I'm reviewing, but in this case I don't find the story or characters particularly interesting. It's all kind of generic, but in case you're still interested, here's a bunch of vague-ish keywords. And that's the story of Dust. From the moment the actual gameplay starts, you get to see one of the game's strongest points, the art. The forest is beautiful, and it doesn't stop in this area. There's underground jungles filled with all sorts of weird plants, snowy mountains with icy caves and vast bleak graveyards with very little colors. And Dust also moves beautifully, every single frame of his animation is hand-drawn, and so are all the other things I just mentioned. You also directly notice the other one of the game's strongest points, the gameplay. Dust controls incredibly fluid, which is also accentuated by his animations. Aside from basic running and jumping, Dust can also perform dodge rolls, and as the game progresses, he'll gain abilities like sliding and double jumping. It won't be long before you run into some monsters. And once again, the sword gameplay is also very good. Dust has two buttons dedicated to swordplay. By simply spamming the main attack button, you'll perform a basic chain of attacks, but by combining it with the secondary attack button after specific other button presses, Dust will perform grabs, launchers, and ground slams. And that's basically it. Dust's actual move list is pretty limited, but it's not about how many different moves you can chain together, it's more about how and when you chain them together to rack up huge combos. Like I said before, Dust can gain experience and level up, gaining a skill gem of your choice with each level. By performing combos with a huge amount of hits, Dust will gain bonus experience. Combos, however, can easily be broken if you're not paying attention. And yes, there is a thousand hit combo quest, and no, I am not doing that. You can also parry incoming attacks by striking at the same time as your enemy. It can be a bit tricky to pull off, but it will leave them extra vulnerable to your attacks. Here's a useful fighting tip. Make sure you're always facing your enemies. When performing combos, Dust's back is pretty much always vulnerable to enemy attacks, which will break your combo. Dust doesn't really have a reliable move that hits things behind him, and he can't really turn around once he's performing a move chain, so use dodge rolls if enemies are sneaking up behind you. Dust will also get an ability called the Dust Storm, which lets him spin his sword around for a while. Oh hey, you can make fidget attack and- You can also perform this in the air. If you do this, Dust will home in on enemies, but what makes this even better is that you retain all the build-up momentum from homing in, which causes Dust to just shoot away to incredible heights. So, the gameplay and art are both amazing, but while I value the game for both those aspects, I still have my gripes. The writing is usually okay, it can get pretty funny at times, but there are times when the writing feels very dated to me. Also not helping is the voice acting, which varies in quality. Dust sounds fine, a bit generic, but fine. It's too dangerous out there for a kid like you. Fidget can be kind of annoying, but I think that's the point. I think it's about time I got this sword back to the clan. The Blade of Aura is exactly what you'd expect a talking sword to sound like. Good, but nothing special. There is a village beyond these woods. Perhaps finding it will aid in restoring your memories. And the villagers tend to be okay-ish. Except if they live in Mudpot. Shut up. Shut the fuck up. Also, remember how I said that the animations are all incredibly fluid and every frame seemed hand-drawn? Yeah, that's true. For Dust. Every other moving thing moves kind of... unnatural. 
They look more like somebody put body parts on an animated skeleton. Now, I do understand it. This was all just one guy, and I think that's a valid enough reason for all those characters moving like that. The only thing in the game not made by Dean Dodrill is the music, which is made by Hyperduck Soundworks, and I don't really find it memorable. It's all orchestral and the instrumentation is well done, but I can't say I remember any of the tracks except the main theme and the map music. It really lacks those catchy main melodies that make music memorable, so that's why I can't really remember any of it. However, while getting the music for this video, I came across the Vintage tracks. These are the songs the game was originally going to use, and also the music I've been using for this review. And I'm sorry, but these songs sound just so much better than what they ended up using. They're all so catchy, and they fit the mood of each area pretty well. I just wish there was a way to change all the music to that in-game. So yeah, the game has a bunch of flaws that hold it back a little, but you know what? Those are just nitpicks. The gameplay is just so good that I don't even care about that. Swinging your sword around and racking up those combos feels extremely satisfying, and on top of that, the game looks incredible, with a few understandable exceptions. Alright, that was dust. I get the feeling this video was a bit on the short side. Let me check. Six minutes? That's way too short. Man, if only there was another indie developed Metroidvania game with hand drawn graphics that I could. Hollow Knight. I'm gonna review Hollow Knight. You you can read the vi title of the video, and I'm not going to patronize you any further. Hollow Knight is the premier indie-developed, hand-drawn Metroidvania bench-sitting simulator of 2017, made by Team Cherry. You place a small bug in a world filled with other bugs. You spend your time exploring enormous labyrinthine caves and corridors filled with less friendly bugs that have fallen under some sort of plague or infection. Hollow Knight is the most beautiful game I've ever played. Not only is all the sprite work done by hand, and beautifully animated at that, all of the areas are just breathtaking with its gothic atmosphere and Victorian Art Nouveau architecture. I made a joke before that this is a bench sitting simulator, but honestly I wouldn't mind if it was because all these benches are scenic as hell. Look at that. I'd sit there. I also like the fact that the game is a metroidvania in more than just the gameplay. It combines areas overgrown with vegetation and fungus and the arthropodic enemy designs of Metroid with the gothic atmosphere and spooky themes of Vania. Where most games lean more to either one of those sides, Hollow Knight provides a very good combination in my opinion, which is, as far as I know, unique. But of course, there's more to a game than just looks. The most important, to me, being gameplay. And honestly, the gameplay is also amazing. Hollow Knight's movement is pretty simple. From the start, you can run, jump, and swing your sword in multiple directions. But with this being a Metroidvania game, there are of course plenty of attack and movement upgrades. A dash, a projectile, a double jump, etc. Some of these abilities draw from your soul gauge, located in the top left corner next to your health. You can also use soul to replenish your health by standing still and focusing. This game has no instant health potion, so healing during something like a boss fight can end up with you getting hit in the process, effectively wasting your soul. You can refill soul by striking enemies or these weird totem poles, or by visiting one of the few hot springs scattered across the map. The special abilities that need soul use up a pretty big chunk of the meter, especially in the beginning, so keep an eye on it and make sure it's full most of the time. This game also offers a good deal of customizability in the form of charms. With charms, you can give yourself certain quirks or boosts, like being able to dash more, getting more souls from each strike, hurting enemies when they hurt you, and many more. You can equip these charms only when sitting on a bench, meaning you can't just cheese a boss fight by swapping out charms at the right moment. Similarly, checking your map and your inventory happens in real time, so make sure you only look at the map when you know it's safe. It's a nice design choice, but your inventory doesn't really have anything in it that's situational, like a health potion. Having to access health potions in real time would provide an interesting challenge, but you already heal by focusing, so aside from adding realism, this mechanic isn't really necessary in my opinion. Speaking of maps, upon visiting a new area, you're not automatically able to see where you are. You have to purchase a map first. Like in Metroid, the map has already filled out a bit, but not completely. You have to explore the rest for yourself. Also, the guy who sells the map can't always be found so easily. He's also not often in the beginning of the area, so for a while, you won't have a clear idea of where you're going, and honestly, that's pretty good design. In a strange way, I liked being lost. If you're in an area of which you don't have any sort of map for, that area feels a lot bigger and more intimidating too. It adds a great sense of mystery. However, interesting as it is, having no map is still pretty inconvenient, so you should try to find the guy sooner or later. 
Also, just because you have the map doesn't mean you can't get lost. First of all, maps only update when you sit on a bench. Actually, now that I think about it, a lot of stuff happens on the bench. Saving, healing, charm editing, map updating. I told you this was a good bench sitting simulator. Second of all, benches can be spread pretty far apart. So while you have charted out the area leading up to the bench, you are now in an area way beyond that and you don't really know where exactly you are. But if you happen to die, you get sent back to your last bench and the map updates automatically. Which is good, because you need to get your stuff back. When you die in this game, you leave behind a shade. That shade has a part of your soul gauge and all your money. Like in the Shovel Knight. So when you die, getting back to your shade is pretty much top priority. Sometimes you'll die in a pretty inconvenient spot though, like a boss fight that's just a bit too much for you and locks you in the room until you've beaten it. Don't worry, you can cheese it. If you quit to the main menu and load up your file, you'll end up at your last bench and everything that happened in between you sitting there and getting your shade back will be saved. This can also be used to quickly go back to a bench instead of backtracking. Lots and lots of backtracking. This is my one minor problem with the game. Like I mentioned before, the benches are spread pretty far apart, although not so far apart that it becomes a problem in my opinion. However, it does become a problem when boss encounters are pretty far away from benches and there are lots of enemies in between the two. So, before you fight the boss again, you need to make your way through a bunch of rooms all while making sure you stay at full health and get a good deal of soul back. This can take quite a bit of time, which makes it a lot harder to develop muscle memory for these fights. The boss fights themselves can get hard but are overall on a level I find acceptable. What makes it a bit unfair in my opinion is the time spent in between the attempts and if you're like me and you have the memory of a fucking goldfish, down. this will Never make mind. these fights harder than they actually are for reasons which I think are a little bit arbitrary. But I don't like berating a game for being too hard. It all depends on how good you are at video games and that's more of a personal thing. Besides, I spend most of my time playing Pokemon and personally, my reflexes are dead in the water. Let's continue. Aside from looking beautiful, this game also has a really nice soundtrack. Every song feels right at home in whatever area it's playing. Most of my favorite tracks come from my favorite areas. A theme I noticed is that the more life there seems to be in a place, the more life there is to the music. And on the flip side, the more bleak and lifeless areas opt for more ambient tracks. Aside from the aforementioned more lively areas, the overall tone of the game is pretty bleak. You often find yourself fighting empty husks of bugs that are long dead but reanimated by some sort of horrible disease. The town of Dirtmouth, one of the first areas you reach, is slowly being abandoned with only one other person roaming the streets. But this is another strong point about Hollow Knight. It's characters. While most of the characters aren't very fleshed out or memorable, the cartoony style in which they're animated and the way that most of them are always making some sort of mouth sound provides an amazing contrast to the otherwise lonely corridors you continuously explore. It's not just the friendly characters either. All enemies are hand-drawn in the same bouncy, cartoony style as the others, and a lot of them also have their own unique sounds, which makes them very identifiable. The bosses especially, with many of them giving a fair vocal warning before an attack. Now about that story, here's a useful tip. Excuse me for getting meta here, but up to now all of my tips have been about making the game experience easier for you, but not this time. I'm gonna give you advice on how to enjoy the game. How to experience it in a way that I feel is the best way. Don't look up anything. Explore for yourself. Learn to fight in your own way. Go your own way. Watch the story unfold. This is why I've not really mentioned the story up to this point. Because I want you to find that out for yourself. Not just the story itself, but how it's presented as well. Believe me, you will have the best Hollow Knight experience this way. Hell, you could argue that every good Metroidvania is best experienced like this. And Hollow Knight is a good Metroidvania. It might even be the best. Yeah.